Well, welcome to this CUBE conversation. I'm John Furrier, your host of the CUBE here in Palo Alto, California. Got a great topic on expanding capabilities for urgent computing. Dan Stanzione, he's executive director of TAC, the Texas Advanced Computing Center, and Rajesh Pohini, v VP of Power Edge HPC Core Compute at Dell Technologies. Gentlemen, welcome to this CUBE conversation. Thanks, Thanks John, good to be here. Rajesh, you got a lot of computing in Power Edge, HPC, core computing. I mean, I get, I get a sense that you love compute. So uh, we'll jump right into it. And of course, I got to love TAC, Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, a lot, I can imagine a lot of stuff going on there. Let's start with the TAC. What is the Texas Advanced Computing Center? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we're part of the University of Texas at Austin here, and we build large scale supercomputers, data systems, AI systems, um, to support open science research. And we're uh, mainly funded by the National Science Foundation. So we support research projects in all fields of science all around the country and around the world. Uh, actually several thousand projects at the moment. <laughs> so tied to the university, got a lot of gear, got a lot of compute, got a lot of cool stuff going on. What's the coolest thing you got going on right now? Uh, well, for me, it's always the next machine, but uh, you know, I think science-wise, it's the machines we have. Uh, you know, we just finished deploying Lone Star Six, which is our latest supercomputer in conjunction with Dell. Uh, a little over 600 nodes of those PowerEd servers that Rajesh builds for us. Um, so, which makes uh, more than 20,000 that we've had here over the years um, of those boxes. But uh, um, that one just went into production. We're designing new systems for a few years from now, um, where we'll be even larger. Um, our Frontera system uh, was top five in the world two years ago, just fell out of the top 10. So we've got to, got to fix that and build the new top 10 system sometime soon. But uh, we, we always have a ton going on um, in large scale computing. Well, I want to get to the Lone Star 6 in a minute on the next talk track, but what are some of the areas that you guys are working on uh, that are making an impact? Take us through, uh, we talked before we came on camera about obviously the academic affiliation, but also there's a real societal impact of the work you're doing. What are some of the key areas that the um, TAC is making an impact? Uh, so there's really a huge range from, you know, new microprocessors, new materials design, photovoltaics, climate modeling, um, basic science and astrophysics and quantum mechanics and things like that. But I think the nearest term impacts that people see are what we call urgent computing, um, which is one of the, the drivers around Lone Star and some rec other recent expansions that we've done. And that's things like uh, there's a hurricane coming, exactly where is it going to land? Can we refine the area where there's going to be either high winds or storm surge? Can we assess the damage from digital imagery afterwards? Um, can we direct first responders and the, the optimal routes? Uh, you know, similarly for earthquakes and a lot recently, as you might imagine around COVID, um, you know, in 2020, we moved almost a third of our resources to doing uh, COVID work full time. Rajesh, I want to get your thoughts on this because Dave Vellante and I have been talking about this on theCUBE recently a lot. Obviously people see what cloud's going on with the cloud uh, technology, but compute and on-premises private cloud has been growing. If you look at the hyperscale on-premises and the edge, if you include that in, you're seeing a lot more user consumption on-premises and now the with 5G, you got edge, you mentioned first responders, Dan. This is now pointing to a new architectural shift as the VP of Power Edge and HPC and Core Compute, you got to look at this and go, hmm, if compute's going to be everywhere in, in locations, you got to have that compute. How does that all work together? And how do you do advanced computing when you have these urgent needs as well as real time in a new architecture? Yeah, John, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty interesting time when you think about some of the changing dynamics and how customers are, are utilizing compute and the compute needs in the industry. We're seeing a couple big trends. One, uh, the the distribution of compute outside of the data center. You know, 5G is, is is really accelerating that. And then you're generating so much data, whether it uh, you know what you do with it, the insights that come out of it, that we're seeing a, a more and more push to you know AI, ML inside the data center. You know, Dan mentioned what he's doing at TAC with you know, computational analysis and, and, and uh, some of the work that they're doing. So what you're seeing is now um, this push the data in the data center and what you do with it while data is being created out at the edge. And it's actually this interesting dichotomy that we're beginning to see. 
Um, you know, you, we, Dan mentioned some of the work that they're doing in, in medical and, and on, on COVID research. You know, even at Dell, we're making cycles available for COVID research using our Zenith cluster that's located in our HPC and AI innovation lab. And we continue to partner with organizations like TAC and others on research activities to continue to learn about the virus, how it mutates and, and then how you treat it. So if you think about all the things, and data that's getting created, you're seeing that distribution and uh, it's really leading to some really cool innovations uh, going forward. Yeah, I want to get to that COVID research, but I want to first, you mentioned a few words I want to get out there. You mentioned Lone Star 6. Okay, so first, what is Lone Star 6? Then we'll get into the system aspect of it. Um, take us through what that definition is. What is Lone Star 6? Well, you know, as Dan mentioned, uh, you know, Lone Star 6 is a Dell technology system that we developed with TAC. It's located at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, it consists of more than 800 Dell PowerEd 6525 servers that are powered with third generation AMD Epic processors. And just to give you an example of the scale uh, of this cluster, it could perform roughly three quadrillion operations per second. That's three petaflops. And to match what Lone Star 6 can compute in one second, a person would have to do one calculation every second for a hundred million years. So it's quite a good sized system and quite a powerful one as well. Dan, what's the role that the system plays? You got petaflops, three, th what, three petaflops you mentioned? That's a lot of flops. So obviously urgent computing, what's, crunk, what's cranking through the system there? Take us through, what's it like? Sure, well, there, there's a mix of workloads on it um, and, and on all our systems. Uh, so uh, there's the urgent computing work, right? Fast turnaround, near real time, whether it's, um, you know, COVID research or uh, doing we project now where we bring in MRI data and are doing sort of patient specific dosing for, uh, you know, radiation treatments and chemotherapy, you know, tailored to your tumor instead of just the sort of general for people your size. Um, you know, that all requires sort of real time turnaround. There's a lot of AI research going on now or incorporating AI into traditional science and engineering research. And that uses an awful lot of data, but also consumes a huge amount of cycles in, in training those models. Um, and then there's, you know, all of our traditional simulation based workloads and materials and digital twins for aircraft and aircraft design in, um, you know, more efficient combustion in uh, more efficient photovoltaic materials or photovoltaic materials without using as much lead and things like that. So, um, you know, and I'm sure I'm missing dozens of other topics because like I said, that that one um, really runs every field of science. We've really focused the, the Lone Star line of systems and this is obviously the sixth one we built um, around our sort of Texas centric users. It's the UT Austin users uh, and then the contributions from Texas A&M and Texas Tech and the University of Texas System, MD Anderson Healthcare Center, the University of North Texas. Um, so users all around the state um, and every research problem that you might imagine those are into. Um, we're just ramping up a project in disaster information systems that's looking at the, the probabilities of flooding in coastal Texas and doing, you know, can we make building code changes to mitigate impact? So we have to change the, the standard foundation heights for new construction um, to mitigate the increasing storm surges from these sort of slow storms that sit there and rain, you know, yeah. like, like hurricanes didn't used to, but seem to be doing more and more. So, um, so, you know, all those problems will run on Lone Star and, and on all the systems to come. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, you mentioned uh, urgent computing. I love that term because it could be an event. It could be some slow kind of brewing event like that rain example you mentioned. Um, it could also be obviously with the healthcare and you mentioned COVID earlier, these are urgent societal challenges and yep. having that available, um, the processing capability, the compute, the data, you mentioned digital twins. I can imagine all this new goodness coming from that. Compare that where you, we were 10 years ago. I mean, just from a, from a mind blowing standpoint, you have how come so far, take us through, can try to give a context to, the, the, the level of where we are now to do this kind of work and where we were years ago. What's uh, can you like give us a feel for that? Sure, uh, there, there's a lot of ways to look at that and you know, how the technology's changed, how we operate around those things and then sort of what our capabilities are. I think you know, one of the big, the first urgent computing things for us um, where we sort of realized we had to adapt to this model of computing was in you know, about 15 years ago with the, the big BP Gulf oil spill, um, 
and you know suddenly we were dumping thousands of processors of load to you know figure out where that oil spill was going to go and and how to do mitigation and what the potential impacts were and where you need to put your containment and things like that um and it was you know well at that point we thought of it as sort of a rare event there was another one um that i think was the first real urgent computing one where the space shuttle was in orbit and they knew something had hit it during takeoff and we were modeling along with nasa and a bunch of supercomputers around the world um uh you know the heat shield and could they make re-entry safely and you know you have until they come back <laughs> to get that problem done you don't have months or years to really investigate that and so um you know what we've sort of learned through some of those the japanese tsunami was another one there have been so many over the years is that one you know these sort of disasters are all the time right one thing or another right if we're not doing hurricanes we're doing wildfires and drought right um you know if it's not covid you know we got good and ready for covid through sars and through um the swine flu and through hiv work and things like that so um is that we can do the computing very fast, but you need to know how to do the work, right? So we've spent a lot of time not only being able to deliver the computing quickly, but having the data in place and having the code in place and having people who know the methods, who know how to use big computers, right? That's been a lot of what the, the COVID consortium, the White House COVID consortium has been about over the last few years. Um, and we're actually trying to modify that nationally into a strategic computing reserve where we're ready to go after these problems where we've run drills, right? And if there's a, you know, there's a train that derails and there's a chemical spill and it's near a major city. We have the tools and the data in place to do wind modeling and we have the terrain ready to go and all those sorts of things that you need to have to be ready. So we've really sort of changed our sort of preparedness and operational model around urgent computing in the last 10 years. Um, also just the way we scheduled the system, the ability to sort of segregate between these long running workflows for things that are you know, really important. Like we displaced a lot of cancer research to do COVID research and cancer is still important, but it's less likely that we're gonna make an impact in the next two months, right? So, uh, you know, we have to shuffle how we operate things and then just, you know, having all that additional capacity. And I, I think one of the things that's really changed in the models is um, our ability to use AI to sort of adroitly steer our simulations um, or prune the space when we're searching parameters for simulations. Um, so we have the operational changes, the system changes, and then things like adding AI on the scientific side, since we have the capacity to do that kind of things now, um, all feed into our sort of preparedness for this kind of stuff. Dan, you got me sold. I want to come work with you. Come on, can I join the team over there? It sounds exciting. Come on down. We always <laughs> need good folks around here. So, Rajesh, when I hear- Almost 200 now and we're always growing. Rajesh, so. when I hear the stories about kind of the evolution, kind of where the state of the art is, you almost see the the the, the innovation trajectory, right? The, the growth and the learning, adding machine learning only extends out more capabilities, but also Dan's kind of pointing out this kind of response, rapid compute engine that they could actually deploy with, with learnings and then software. So is this a model where anyone can call up and get some cycles to say power an autonomous vehicle or, hey, I want to point the machinery and the cycles at something as a service. Do you see guys see this going that direction or how, how does, cause this sounds like really, really good. Yeah, I, I mean, one thing that Dan talked about was it's not just the compute, it's also having the, the right algorithms, the software, the code, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the ability to learn. So I think when those are set up, yeah, I mean, the ability to digitally simulate in any number of industries and areas, uh, you know, uh, advances the pace of innovation, reduces the time, uh, you know, to market of, of whatever a customer is trying to do or research or even vaccines or other healthcare things. If you can reduce that time through uh, uh, the leverage of compute on doing digital simulations, um, you know, it just makes things better for society or for whatever it is that we're trying to do uh, yeah. uh, in a particular industry. I think the idea of instrumenting stuff is, is, is here for forever and also simulations, whether it's digital twins and doing these kinds of real time models isn't really much of a guess. So I think this is huge uh, historic moment. Um, but you know, you guys are pushing the envelope here at the University of Texas and, and at Tech. Um, it's not just research, you guys got real examples. So where do you guys see this going next? I see, you know, space, big compute areas that might need some, some um, data to be cranked out. You got uh, cybersecurity, you got healthcare, uh, you mentioned oil spill, you got oil and gas, I mean, you got industry, you got, you know, climate change. I mean, there's so much to tackle. 
What's next? Absolutely, and I think um, you know the the appetite for computing cycles isn't going anywhere, right? And it's only going to it's going to grow without bound, essentially. And um, AI, while in some ways it reduces the amount of uh, computing we do, it's also brought you know this whole new domain of modeling to a bunch of fields um, that you know weren't traditionally computational, right? We used to just do uh, you know, engineering, physics, chemistry, were all super computational. Um, but then we got into genome sequencers and imaging and a whole bunch of data and that made biology computational. And with AI, now we're making things like, you know, the behavior of human society and things, computational problems, right? So there, there's this sort of growing amount of workload that is in one way or another computational um, and getting bigger and bigger. So, uh, you know, so that's going to keep on growing. I think, you know, the, the trick is not only going to be growing the computation, but growing the, the software and the people um, along with it, because, uh, you know, we, we have amazing capabilities that we can bring to bear. We don't, we don't have enough people to hit all of them at once. And so um, that, that's probably going to be the next frontier in growing out, you know, both our AI and simulation capabilities is the human male element of it. It's interesting so. when you think about society, right? If things become too predictable, what does a democracy even look like if you know the election is going to be over two years from now in the United States? Or you look at these major, major waves <laughs> of innovation, you say, hmm. So it, it, you know, democracy, AI, maybe there's an algorithm for checking up on the AI because biases. So again, there's so many uh, use cases that just come out of this, it's just incredible. Yeah, and you know, bias in AI is something that we worry about and we work on and I'm on some task forces where we're working on that particular problem because the AI is going to take is, you know, based on, especially when you look at like a deep learning model, it's a hundred percent a product of the data you show it, right? So if you show it a biased data set, it's going to have biased results. And it's not anything intrinsic about the computer or the, the, the personality of the AI. It's just data mining, right? In essence, right? It's learning from data. And, you know, if you show it, all images of one particular outcome, it's going to assume that's always the outcome, right? It just has no choice but to see that. So, um, so how we deal with bias, how do we deal with confirmation, right? I mean, you know, in addition, you, you have to recognize uh, if you haven't, if it gets data it's never seen before, how do you know it's not wrong, right? So there's a lot about data quality and um, quality assurance and quality checking around AI. And that's where, um, you know, especially in scientific research, we use what's starting to be called things like physics informed or physics constrained AI, um, where, you know, the neural net, you know, that you're using to design an aircraft still has to, you know, um, follow basic physical laws in its output, right? Or, you know, if you're doing some materials or astrophysics, you still have to obey conservation of mass, right? You know, so um, the AI can't say, well, if you just apply negative mass on this other side and positive mass on this side, everything works out, right? For stable flight, because we can't do negative mass, right? So you have to constrain it in the real world. So um, this, this notion of how we bring in the laws of physics and constrain your AI to what's possible, um, uh, is also a big part of the sort of AI research going forward. You know, Dan, you just, it's, to me, just encapsulate the science that's still out there that's needed. Computer science, social science, uh, material science, kind of all converging right yeah. now. Engineering, it's, yeah. Engineering, yeah. science, it's physics, all there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not just yeah. code. And Rajesh, data, you mentioned data. The more data you have, the better the AI. We have a, a world that's going from silos to open control planes. The, you, we have to get to a world, this is a cultural shift we're seeing. What's your thoughts? Well, you know, it, it, it is um, in that, you know, the, the ability to drive predictive analysis based on the data uh, is, is going to, you know, drive different behaviors, right? Different, different social behaviors, different cultural uh, impacts. Um, but I think, you know, the point that Dan made about bias, right? It's only as good as, as you know, the, the, the code that's written and, and the way that the data is actually brought in to the system. So making sure that that is, that is done in a way that, that generates the right kind of outcome, you know, that allows you to use that in a predictive manner becomes critically important. If, if it is biased, uh, you're going to lose credibility in a lot of that, that analysis that comes out of it. So, um, I, you know, I think that becomes critically important. Um, but overall, I mean, if you think about the way compute is, I mean, it's becoming pervasive. It's not just in, in selected industries, as Dan mentioned, it's now uh, applying to everything that you do, right? Whether it is getting you more tailored recommendations for your purchasing, 
right? If, you know, you have better options that way. You don't have to sift through a lot of different ideas that, you know, as you scroll online, it's tailoring now to some of your habits and what you're looking for. So that, that becomes an incredible time saver for people to be able to get what they want in a way that they want it. Um, and then you look at the way it impacts other industries and, and, and development innovation. It just, it just continues to scale and scale and scale. Well, I think the work that you guys are doing together um, is scratching the surface of the future, which is digital business. It's about data, it's about all these new things. It's about advanced computing meets the right algorithms for the right purpose. And it's a really amazing uh, operation you guys got over there, Dan. Great to hear the stories. Um, it's very provocative, very enticing to just want to jump in and hang out. But, you know, I got to do the CUBE day job here, but congratulations on uh, success. We're just great to see you and thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for having us, John. Okay. Thanks very much. Great mm -hmm. conversation around urgent computing as computing becomes so much more important, bigger problems and opportunities are around the corner. And this is theCUBE, we're documenting it all here. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.